Hey, everybody. Welcome to It's Real with Jordan and Demi. In Los Angeles, it's Jordan Edwards. In New York, we got Demi Ramos. What's up, Demi? Jordan, how are you doing? I'm good. And today we've got Brent Smith from Shinedown. What's up, Brent? Hanging out, man. Nobody panic. We're recording. Here we go. Are you in the studio right now? No, I'm actually, um, I'm in Bel Air at the moment. So um, I'm hanging out in an undisclosed location in Bel Air. The fresh find down of Bel Air. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, no. <laughs> no, no, I'm lucky to be in this building. Let's just put it this way. What's well, it's a cool, it's a cool right thing now that are massively more attractive than I am. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm just, I just snuck in here. <laughs> Well, we're with Brent Smith, and he's squatting in a fancy studio in Bel Air. There you go. And, uh, that's more rock and roll. Yeah, yeah it's, that's pretty rock and roll. Um, so, Brent, you guys have this new album, Planet Zero, out. We do. Um, it's it's kind of a mix of classic Shine Down. There's a little bit of progginess to it. Yeah. So um, let's talk about. I know that this is recorded. You guys, did you guys hole up and record this like in one big kind of marathon session, or was this files? you know, swapped back and forth between band members. Cause I know your bassist yeah. uh, produced this. Yeah. He did the last two albums. Actually, he engineered, mixed and produced the last two shine down records. We did them all in South Carolina in Charleston. Uh, this last one we did uh, closer to Kiowa Island. Um, I arrived in South Carolina with Eric um, on June 1st of 2020. And we delivered the record um, in January of this year, 2022. Um, you know, very rarely does an artist and an audience um, get to um, experience something uh, all together at the same time for the first time. And the big dynamic with this album was it was written during a global pandemic. So it was really difficult to try to have that crystal ball method, which we tried in the beginning when we when we started writing it of saying, let's try to write like three years from now because no one's going to want to talk about this. And it just kept getting more and more intense. And we we have to write about what we know. And uh, I remember that first writing session uh, in in Charleston, when I got there, I remember Eric looking at me and going, it feels like we're on planet zero. And, uh, and then, then we were off. Yeah. So, so the, the title kind of naturally gave itself to you. Yeah. Because I was yeah. calling studios trying to get an idea. This was 2020, uh, right. it was June. So I'm calling different studios and they all know me. We've worked there over the years and what have you a lot in California. And they were like, you know, asking like, Hey, you know, do partitions, we'll go 10 feet away, this and that. And the other, like, what do you, what would you allow studio wise? And they're like, Brent, we can't let anybody in here. And I go, okay. And it was also getting more and more apparent that studios were not letting people come in and we had to start, we didn't have a studio to work in. Mm -hmm. So we're on Eric's property. We're working in kind of his home studio. That's not set up for what we do. And we made a big decision um, at that moment in time, probably roughly like right before July. Um, we said, let's just build a studio here. So we spent 18 weeks and nobody slept and we built a studio from the ground up. Wow. Yeah. I mean, you guys could really work with any producer in the world. Um, how did you guys come to like, let's have this so in-house. Yeah. Well, we're going to work with our producer, uh, our bass player as a producer for these. Um, a lot of experience being with him um, and over the years, um, you know, when you're working, like you said, we've been so, so fortunate to have ultimately worked around incredible engineers, producers, uh, audio mixers, male and female. Um, and, you know, at a certain point in time, Eric had started to do productions for Shine Down. Um, as soon as he got into the band, his first production that he did was he recorded Diamond Eyes. And, you know, me, him and Zach wrote that, but that's his production. Then uh, there was a movie called Her Name Was Alice. Uh, Her Name Is Alice with uh, Johnny Depp. We did a song on there called, um, or the movie was called Through the Looking Glass. 
And we did a song called Her Name Is Alice. That's his production, you know, wrote the song with me and what have you. Then uh, the first Avengers movie, we had a song called I'm Alive, that that's Eric's production. And then moving into the other albums and what have you, he was becoming way more of a songwriter with all of us uh, from literally like the Sound of Madness album on. So what I'm getting at is you take a lot of notes and you learn a lot from a lot of different people. By the time we got to Attention, Attention, Eric had done like certain songs, but he had never done a full record, but it was time for him to do a, a, the entire album. So we started with that record. Um, the record speaks for itself. Um, and we just looked at it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it on this one. And uh, he would probably tell you he has a little bit of PTSD from this last <laughs> album, um, you know, maybe Why? because because it was just it was so intense it was just everything was intense um the songwriting was intense the sound that he had in his head for this particular record you know we have this thing where we're so respectful of all different styles of music like we're a band that tries not to write the same song over and over again and we do our best not to write we try to not make the same record twice so the dynamic was just with with Eric. We he had a certain sound. You know, we call it. We don't. We never. We don't want to be banned in a can. And what that means is, a lot of times you have the same producers, same engineers, same mixers for different genres, and everything starts sounding the same. Mm -hmm. And the unique thing about Eric Bass is only Eric can be Eric. He's not mixing with like already these set EQ points and things of that nature. Like. He's recording and he's engineering and he's producing with his heart and his mind. You know what I mean? Like when he hears it back out of the speaker, he doesn't care how he got it. He just wants, he has a thing that he hears and he just, he wants to hear that. It's one of the reasons why this record, quite frankly, I, I think it's, um, it's a very ferocious record because for this album, he didn't put a lot of sugar on everything on this record, everything is pushed to the front. A lot of the vocals are dry. You know, wow. the guitars are massive for a reason. Um, we had an incredible engineer um, who's worked with us since the Sound of Madness album on named Doug McKean. Um, and uh, he was so instrumental in the in, in every Shine Down record from Sound of Madness to Planet Zero. Uh, I, I bring him up because he recently passed away um and uh he, he was such a huge massive influence um all of the the biggest records in the world i guarantee you doug had a hand in engineering them um and uh, he's a grammy award winner um uh he won uh he won the grammy for record of the year american idiot uh by green day and so when you and we worked with rob cavallo once again producer green day my chemical romance of black parade go i can go on and on and on and you just learn from these individuals, you know, what to do, what not to do. And ultimately, um, that's the beauty of being a musician, though. There's, there's no right or wrong. It's just how you feel. Well, Brent, it's inspiring that 20 years into Shine Down, you still have the enthusiasm as someone who's on their first or second album, which is brilliant. Yeah, 100 nice. percent. I love it. Um, and you mentioned, you don't you, you know, not want to be a band in a can. You guys have had hit singles number one singles on all your albums basically you know like yeah. running through what seven 17 number one hits on the main so the crazy the, the crazy thing about that is that our newest single uh daylight officially today uh became number one on rock radio which makes it our 19th number one and uh we've released 29 singles as a band in the last uh 20 years so to even be able to say that we have 19 number ones on rock radio is insane. Yeah. Um, so I don't take it for granted. Yeah. And so besides you talked a lot about the production, but how do you keep the songwriting fresh? You know, like keeping the song structure different. I mean, a good example is, you know, the intro to this to this album is like this little 20, 25 second. Yeah. Of, you know, kind of um, almost Omar, to, inspired uh, kind of rush inspired. 1984 uh, kind of yeah exactly more exactly. than anything right so how do you keep it fresh and not just do the same like not just do you know 
other Shinedown songs over and over again. Um, you know, not do Cut the Cord Part 2, 3, 4, and 5. You know? Right. So there is a, uh, there's a balance in all of it. Uh, it's one of the reasons that the band is called Shinedown in the first place. It's the yin and the yang. Sometimes you shine, sometimes you're down, which also gives you a balance of everything that's good has a little bit of bad and everything that's bad has a little bit of good. So you have to find the medium. Um, you have to find the center. We, we have a style, um, but we evolved that style. I've often said, um, and the answer to your question is this, we have one boss in this band um, and that's everybody in the audience. So at the end of the day, people aren't stupid. Um, they know if you're not being real, they know if it's not authentic, uh, they're not desensitized to emotions. People are very smart and very in tune to that. Um, our audience, whether they've been there from the beginning or they're just finding out about us, um, cause we have a very broad audience. Um, they've always allowed us to be ourselves. So like if we go in, it's not just drums, bass, guitar, vocals, um, and a song necessarily. We add orchestration to things. We add synth. We bring in all these different components. We add horns to things. We layer vocals. Um, you know, we 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 just don't put any limitations on what we want to do as long as the song is being honest with us and saying this is what I need. Um, then that's how we'll record it. That's how we'll um, engineer it, and that's how we'll present it to the world. Um, I've often said that you write a hundred songs and you hope that you wrote 10 really good ones and you pray you wrote one phenomenal one and then you just write a hundred more. Yeah. It's practice more than anything. You have to practice. It's the same thing with, with live too. I get asked a lot of times like from younger individuals that want to be in the music industry and that want to be artists and what have you and what's the advice I can give them. And the advice is practice, practice, practice. And what I mean by that is like, you know, write your own songs. Your publishing will give you a career. And, you know, as far as live is concerned, don't stay inside your house on your Instagram. Like, go out and play for people. I've played in front of five people before. I've also played in front of 500,000. So you have to do it a lot. Well, Demi, Demi's in a trio, and I've seen she plays rooftop shows that get broken up by the cops. In I love Austin, that. So, yeah. Speaking of um, Instagram, even, like, Music being this universal language, where do you think it's heading now that the inner, like the internet, is so vital in being, you know, in any artist project? You, you guys enjoy having it, to do all that stuff and branding. It depends on the. It depends on the app. It depends on the yeah, network. Definitely. Like you have TikTok, you have Snapchat, um, Snapchat. You have Twitter still, which Twitter is a lot more political than musical, um, but it's still, you know, it's it, it's still influential. Um, you know, you have all these different streaming services and, and what have you, obviously Instagram, Facebook is still around, you know, um, but like with TikTok, for example, that's 30 seconds at best. So the attention span is very, very short. Um, what we have to do is we have to look and be honest to ourselves and the way that we present our, uh, our band and, you know, I guess in some circles, quote unquote, your brand and what you're selling and things of that nature. But we just try to stay very real to who we are. We're not trying to copy anybody else because we don't want to. Um, and we have a certain style. Um, but also, too, I will often tell people, remember that branding and those outlets and what have you, you know, remember you're in control of the device. The device shouldn't be in control of you. Mm -hmm. And so with that also as far as a songwriter and a musician with these types of social media outlets um a lot of it is disposable right now so ask yourself a question if you're a musician or you're a performer are you going to do things that are going to outlast you and what i mean by that is when you're gone from this earth will your art still be relevant to people so you are the front man of Shinedown. I am. That's what let's they say. About, yeah. Well, let's talk about leading the band and kind of like the pressures maybe that the front man of a band may experience um, more than anyone else in the band. I know you guys do this as a team at the end of the yeah. day, but 
how does it feel to front a band, especially as big as your own? Um, it's very humbling. Um, it's a lot of hard work um, that I asked for. <laughs> um, I think more than anything, it's interesting because like we tour a lot. I'm on the road 280 days out of the year, um, at least. Um, and the dynamic of that is all of us in the band, we all have families, we all have kids. Um, you know, um, we have a lot of responsibilities. We're lucky that our families um, understand, truly understand what we do. And that part of that is we have to be out and we have to be gone. Um, when I'm on the road 20 years into this, you know, and how I look at the next 20 years is I always try to lead by example and I try to be the hardest worker in the room, but I also try to surround myself with like-minded people. And I take it very seriously. The fact that I'm running, um, a business in a corporation out on the road our core staff of people that we have out there, you're looking at close to like 33, 34 people. That's the core. Mm -hmm. And then on top of how big the shows are and you know how large of a design we've put together on a daily basis. I mean, you're working with locals when you're touring and depending on the size and what have you, you know, you're responsible for over a hundred and something people. Um, and that's a daily thing. Um, so, not only do I have my own family and my my brotherhood with the guys I'm in a band with, you know, I think about everybody in our crew and their kids and their family. And I think about our management and all the people that have been with us for 20 years, our record label, which is Atlantic Records, which we're an anomaly in a lot of ways with that. Yeah. Um, you know, we've been on Atlantic Records for 20 years um, and we're still on Atlantic Records. And we've been with the same manager, Bill McGathy, and Indigood and McGathy Promotions for the last 20 years. So going back to your question about being a frontman, the biggest thing and why I'm saying all that is because I have all these people I'm responsible for. And um, because every ship has to have a captain. You know what I mean? Like, you got to have... Um, and Zach, our guitar player, said this before, like, we're a democracy with a leader. That's, that's good. Now, it's interesting, Bert, because Shinedown started kind of as like a a solo project. They retained you. They wanted you to do a solo. And they like, you made the band kind of so, as... It's a wild story. Yeah, it's a whole wild thing. So you start out as kind of the solo act. And you, and a lot of times when that happens, whether it's, you know, when a, when a quote-unquote solo act has a band they're just like the solo act with the backing band, but you made it to where it's actually like a band band. Oh, um, it's a band. Yeah, it's a band. Why did you decide to go that route instead of just doing like Brent Smith and these guys back here and we're shine down, you know? Well, because my name is Brent Smith and that's the most boring name in rock and roll. It is. Right, it, so you know, I had yeah. to have something that was gonna have a little pizzazz. Yeah, it's true. It's true. <laughs> So, no, I mean, it's a really, it's almost Shakespearean, the, sto the story, and it's still being written, which is even... Right. I'm, I, listen, you're, you're hanging out right now with one of the, like, probably the luckiest human being on the planet. I'm very lucky, and I'm, I'm, my humility is, is broad because, like, I'm humbled by it all. Um, I think the easiest way to, to describe how it happened in because it's a long story and I'm going to give you a kind of a rapid fire. Yeah. Um, I was based out of Knoxville, Tennessee. That's where I was born and raised. I was signed to a band by Steve Robertson from Atlantic Records. It was interesting when 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 Steve came to see that band in Knoxville. A&R for Atlantic Records. Um, he brought a legendary producer, Michael Beinhorn, with him. Um, so it was interesting when, you know, meeting Michael Beinhorn and meeting the producer of arguably my favorite record of all time, which is Super Unknown by Soundgarden, which he produced, um, along with countless other legendary records. Um, so long story short, the band was signed. And then about nine months in, Steve 
uh, called me and was like, I want you to go to Los Angeles. I want you to write with some songwriters. And I was like, okay, I'm in a band though. Like I need to bring one of the guys from the band that you signed. And he goes, no, 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 no. I just want you to do it. And I'm like, okay. So I went and I did it <clears throat> and I wrote some songs and we recorded them and then got back and I was feeling really, really good about it. Um, and then uh, Atlantic dropped the band. And then I was making a decision of whether I was going to go to New York or whether I was going to go to Los Angeles. And about two weeks after we got dropped, um, Steve called me and said, how are you doing? And I go, I'm good, man. And he goes, you're probably a little annoyed with me. I'm like, no, not at all. You're doing your job, man. And he was like, OK, I'm glad we got that out of the way. Uh, I want to sign. I want to sign you again. And I'm like, what? And he goes, I want to sign you to a development deal which I had no idea what that meant. Um, and what year is this? This is 20, uh, 2000. This is 2000. 2000. Yeah. Um, so this is me getting to the point. I signed the deal. That then took me on a three-year journey to three years from that point, um, Shine Down releasing its debut album, Leave a Whisper, in 2003. But what transpired was with me and Steve, it was trains, planes, and automobiles. Like he put me in front of every single songwriter, every single person, anybody that would take me, like anyone that would do, uh, that would do a session with me, that would spend any time with me. And it was nonstop all the time. And then the goal was always to create a band because I'd never wanted to be a solo artist. And so over time, it led me to Jacksonville, Florida. And um, I was kind of doing it in tandem. I, I was working out of Orlando, working out of Jacksonville, but I was still flying and driving and with Steve, like going to all these different locations all over the world, um, riding with these different people. Um, and that's how we, that's how we created the band. Um, it was, uh, as obviously there's a lot more detail in that, but that's kind of in a nutshell, like how it happened. And once again, Steve Robertson, a and &R of the band, still the a and r of the band to this day it's crazy uh, through the formative years what kind of because you were also growing up as a young adult what kind of yeah. emotions and what kind of a roller coaster of a ride was that because you were like 19 or 18 19 i was 19 19 yeah. 20 i was i was just yeah I, I was roughly like 20 20 i would say yeah. i mean here's the thing at 10 years old I, I kind of had, um, I don't know, man, like a light bulb went off when I was like 10. Um, I could write down, I didn't know what a sonnet was. I didn't know what riddles were necessarily. I didn't know what poetry was or any of that, but I would write like that. I would write in a song form and I could convey exactly how I felt onto a piece of paper. And, and by the way, I don't, type out to this day i write everything down um there's something about it going from your mind to your arm to the pet to the pen to the piece of paper and then creating it and making it real um and putting it out into the into the universe um i just have always been able to do it in a song form i've always been in touch with my emotions um i also am very aware of my surroundings um Everything that I write about is honesty, though. It, it all comes from a real place. Unless we're commissioned for like a movie or for a television series or for an ad campaign or something like that. Like I remember when Sylvester Stallone, you know, called us and he was like, I want you to do a song for this movie. It's called The Expendables. And we wrote Diamond Eyes. And he gave us kind of like the the dynamic of the movie and what have you, but he like let us go. But he actually gave us a lot of really cool direction. But when it comes to us, and what we're conveying and what we're putting out there, it has to come from an honest place. And it's either the scenarios that we've been involved in, the situations, the people that we've met, you know, uh, subject matter in our own lives. Um, we meet a lot of people and they have these incredible stories. Um, and, and you pull from, from life experience. I mean, I think that's one of the biggest things for us. It's why uh, we constantly evolve because there's as long as you're given the breath to have a tomorrow 
don't waste it because you're not you're not promised the next day. What do you listen to in your when you have time just listen to music? What kind of stuff do you listen to? What am I listening to right now? I'm listening to the uh, Spirit Box la uh, right now. Um, I'm listening to a lot of uh, my boy Jelly Roll, who's just crushing it right now. He's got like the, I don't know what, he's on the Hot 100 with Son of a Sinner. I'm so proud of him. Uh, he's, we're doing uh, our fall tours with John Harvey and Jelly Roll, so I'm super stoked. I've been listening to those guys a lot. But the thing about me is that my biggest influence and in what I go back to when I need to center myself um, you know, my dad changed my life when I was 15 years old. He introduced me to a guy named Otis Redding, which introduced me and opened this door to soul and Motown and, and R and B because Otis Redding got me to Sam Cooke, Al Green, Marvin Gaye, uh, and then Percy Sledge. Percy Sledge got me to Nina Simone, Ella Fitzgerald, Billy Holiday. Um, and the list kind of goes on and on. So, um, when I was a early teenager, this whole new world kind of opened up for me in regards to like soul music. Cause I was listening to a lot of like thrash and like hardcore punk. And I was going to ask you, are you, my dad would, my dad would come into my room and I'm listening to like Wendy O Williams and the dwarves and like the misfits. And my dad is like, I have no idea why these people are so mad. <laughs> like, I, just, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but he's like, oh, I, I, I like, I, you know, I can respect like what you're into, but he gives me this tape and I'm like, thanks dad. He turns around and I'm like, throw it in the corner. And then like a couple of weeks later, I'm like cleaning up my room and I find the tape and I'm like, let me see what this is all about. So I put it in and it's this anthology of, of, of Otis Redding. And it was like eating chocolate cake for the first time. It was just like, what is this? Because <laughs> That was the first time that I had heard a voice truly used as an instrument. It's one of the reasons I have such a massive affection for Amy Winehouse. Um, and then, you know, it's, uh, you know, soul singers, jazz singers, like they, they, they like get me. Like when you're, when a person uses their voice as an instrument, I'm sold. Well, you're obviously a hard rock band, but there is, I do think there is like some soul and pop influences in your- It's all built around melody. Vocals. It's gotta be built around melody. Yeah. Like, you have to remember it. Yeah. Like, here's the thing too, people will ask me, they're like, do you get embarrassed when you hear your stuff? Like if you're out and about, or if you're in a car and your stuff comes on, you're like with people, I'm like, what are you asking me? And they're like, well, like, is it weird? I'm like, some artists will go like, nah, I turn it, I turn it off, man. It's mm. embarrassing. I'm like, screw that, man. I'm proud of it. I turn it up. Love it. You know? Love it. So and it's then, like you need to be proud of it. You know what I mean? And that kind of touches on another thing, Brent, is that one thing that when I think of Shine Dan, I think of a band that's that can be simultaneously vicious and hard, but also radio friendly and with pop song structures. So, you know what? I don't think that we're. I don't think that it's about being radio friendly. Like with this band, with with Shine Down, with us, it's about being radio ready. Okay. Like, okay. Uh, well, you get you go to the radio. You know, welcome to the show. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's cutthroat, man. It is, dude. I tell people this all the time. I'm like, don't get into this and be sensitive. Like, yes, we're artists and all that, man. But like you just said. You have to have a willingness to understand that it's a business. Like it is a business and it will devour you if you let it, it will digest you and, and use up all the good parts about you and throw the rest of you away. You have to understand that about it. Like the music business is, can be very rewarding, but you gotta know what you signed up for. And a lot of times people will say things like, you know, like back in the day when people would talk about how when we crossed over with Second Chance, we crossed up, we're in the middle of crossing over right now with Daylight to different formats. You yeah. know, when Casey Kasem signed off the air, who's a legendary DJ, you know, um, when he signed off the air after 40 years of being probably the, the most famous American DJ of all time, when he signed off the air, the number one song in the country was Second Chance, you know. 
And so the dynamic of this, like when people are like, you know, radio friendly or mainstream or all oh, you sold out, I'm like, sure. No, we but I, I was trying to give you a compliment, Brent. I, I think that's, oh, no, 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 I think no, no. it's good. It's, yeah. I, I, no, no, no. I get it. But the thing is, is like when people have that idea of like, you know, oh, they sold out or they I think that's so out. silly because you mentioned you mentioned Super Unknown. That's a great example of a record that's both something that's digestible and had radio singles, but also was very um, visceral and very hard, you know, and, and, 100%. and you came up, you know, when you were growing up, things like, uh, Metallica black album. Was yeah, huge and that, that absolutely. But I think that, you know, that, that ideology is, you know, I look at it like the Newstead mentality, which is, yeah, we sell out every seat in the house. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. and that whole dynamic, this as a band, I'm being totally upfront with you. This band owes everything to radio, encompassing terrestrial radio, the whole mm -hmm. nine. Like, because in the beginning, mainstream, they did not get us. Like, I remember a lot of interviewers and, and what have you in the beginning, the first album, which will be 20 years old next year, which is crazy. Um, you know, a lot of people were like, this band would be lucky to sell five records. Like, they meant five, you know. <laughs> You know, I, I wish nothing bad on anybody, but you know, those people that said that don't work in the business anymore. Let's go, baby. You know, who's so on their five? I don't believe that. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's part of it, man. Like you have to have, you know, you have to have a tough exterior, and remember, you're, it's, you're gonna be judged no matter what. But that's the beauty of it. That's where the fan base comes in. Like our audience. I, you have never in your life seen a more like encompassing, like it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, what your background is, anyone from anywhere at any time in the Shinedown Nation world, in that community, bring it on. Whoever wants to come, whoever wants to come in, everyone's welcome from at any time from anywhere. When I think of the, the biggest rock bands the last 20, 25 years, it's you, obviously, Another band I think of kind of in that success hard rock area with a lot of hit singles is Seether. And we had yeah. Sean, we had Sean Morgan on the show a while back. Really fun to talk to. Yeah. Do you do you kind of have a friendly rivalry with those guys because you did come kind of come up at the same time and have all these hit singles? That you're I'm sure a lot of your singles were kind of like neck and neck, you know. There's based not, on no, man, there's not really a rivalry. Even in the early days of that, I never really thought about that. Like, I, you know, when you're out there and you're, man, it, it's, it's wild. Like, I've said this before, like, being in Shinedown is also like being in the third grade forever. You know, <laughs> like, you, you're a kid. You get to do all these kind of things where you're like, is this really like what I get to do? You know, I mean, yeah, there's a whole lot of hard work into it, but you don't forget why you, why you started. Like, you yeah. got to remember, I often will tell people like, yo, come like bring it back to the front here for a minute remember this is fun this is supposed to be fun like that's yeah. why we do it you know what i mean so there's never i've never looked at like a rivalry from anyone i champion everybody that if you have a message that's powerful and it's honest i'm gonna champion you yeah i love it i love the positivity, I love the positivity. one question we asked um the frontman of cedar was uh it's a very important question how do you feel about uh new rock acts like mgk you know i got nothing but love for him okay you know, i got nothing but zach like my our guitar player zach is out doing a run right now with uh one of the side bands that he works with from time to time and he's out on tour with the band hansen and um he uh just went to uh he didn't go to the stadium show that i think was like saturday night um in cleveland um but Zach uh, was just with him uh, at his show backstage. They were hanging out the other night. That's cool. That's cool. Look, man, I mean, and he, the thing about him is, dude, good on you. Like, you don't want to be pigeonholed, man. If you want to do something different, go do something different. I mean, obviously, now he admits he probably shouldn't have, you know, had that little beef with Corey Taylor. That mm. wasn't wise. By yeah, stretch of the imagination. What like, was yeah. it with Corey Taylor? Yeah, yeah the well, Corey from Slipknot. We talked about that when Sean Morgan. Yeah, was okay, okay. yeah. 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 but I, I believe that's been. I believe that's yeah. been reconciled. Yeah, yeah. you know. 
Um, but you know, th that's the, the thing, like musicians were always going to be, you know, look, man, you're dealing with a lot of like passionate people, male mm -hmm. and female. Um, but you know, I got nothing but love for MGK, man. I got nothing, I got nothing but love for Corey Taylor. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Love it. I got nothing love for love, uh, got nothing but love for MGK as well. <laughs> I can see your eyes all lit up. She got, like, she got a little crush. She got a little I'm crush. Like, oh my lord! She got a little crush. She, got, like, the vapors. Like, she got the vapors. Oh. I'm gonna stay here for a second. Yeah, we have to like you know. You have to take a cold and, uh, shower, girl. She gone. Look at she took herself off. She took a video like, off. I'm out. <laughs> She's gone. She's gone. She's She's gone. Left. I'll be I back in sixty seconds. All right. All right. On, on, the, on that note, Brent, we'll let you go. Um, thank you so much. And and um, we're recording this right before Labor Day, but you're heading out on tour. Tell us about the tour that will be starting by the time this airs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, so we're going out with Jelly Roll and John Harvey. Uh, we're starting um, uh, right uh, at the beginning of... Um, when do we start, actually? I think the first show is the second or the first in prior Oklahoma. Uh, but yeah, we start... Uh, we're going to make up show um in knoxville tennessee on the 28th of, okay. of august and then uh we head out to tour with john harvey and jelly roll that goes all the way through october the 9th october 10th i believe all amphitheaters in the united states and then we head over to uh europe and the uk to headline with our friends in asking alexandria and uh 0936 in europe and the uk and then we just put 40 holds on 2023 man so we just keep moving. oh man it's got to be, you got to be rare and get, you got to be like really rare to go to like go out on the road and play these songs live that you guys have been hitting on, on rock radio. We've been, yeah, we've been touring already. Uh, yeah, we started touring at the beginning of this year and uh, haven't looked back. You know, we were touring last year in the middle of the summer. We came out kind of like warming up everybody to some shows that had to be rescheduled and what have you. Um, but uh, yeah, we've been going strong this whole year. So, and, right. uh, and I appreciate you guys giving me the time today. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for telling us all these stories and, and really giving us some positive, uh, some motivation, honestly. Like I feel, I feel motivated now after, after talking to you. Yeah, man. I look forward to seeing you guys in the future. Thanks again Absolutely. for, uh, the chat. I had a great time. Absolutely. All right. All right. Thanks Brent. Bye. That was Brent Smith from shine down. The new album planet zero is out now. I love talking to people who can have that kind of enthusiasm and that kind of positivity after all these years. He's not jaded. He's not, you know, bitter. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be bitter if I had sold millions of records and had 18, 19 number one hits. I wouldn't be bitter either. <laughs> but uh, you know, I love that. He's like a he's like a 20 year old who just signed his first deal, you know. Jimmy, how you doing? I'm once again talking about Machine Gun Kelly on the show. So that's how I'm doing. Yeah. But yeah, like you said, I mean, someone who as legendary as a band like Shinedown, um, he's also encouraging people like MGK or just other people to do rock and roll. And that's pretty cool instead of, you know, we had like a definitely a different reaction from Cedar. You know? Yeah. Yeah. From yeah. Sean Morgan, definitely. Yeah. yeah get a diff but that was a different, that was a whole different deal. Different deal. Yeah. Um, but I appreciate you, Demi, trying to like goad him into talking smack. Like that was nice. That was nice. Oh you, you've been you've been you've been a host too long now that you're like trying to hit the buttons when we have a guest. Like, what can I say to like get a? <laughs> Not at all. You know, you know that's just curious. curious. All right. Um, well, guys, that's it for us. As always, go to popdust.com for the latest in pop culture and music news and. Follow us on Instagram. I'm at Jordan Edwards Studio. Demi is at Demi underscore Ramos. And listen to past episodes on Spotify, Heart Radio, wherever you listen to podcasts and watch us on YouTube, Facebook Watch, and TikTok. Until next time, we'll see you later. Mm -hmm.